So anyway, as Dana mentioned to folks, uh, I did have a great, great time, and I'm going to share some of what I I found out when I went to England um, last, uh, wow, it's, it's January, so it's almost a year now. Um, and to tell you the truth, uh, I went because it's Dana's fault, uh, as it always is. When I was at the uh, library at the Monmouth County uh, Historic Association of Freehold, she always trots downstairs and brings up all this wonderful information. And this particular time over a year ago, I asked her to bring me up what she had about the heart swords, uh, which is voluminous. Uh, they, they kept every piece of paper, right, Dana, that they ever ever wrote on. They sure did. We have 72 boxes of heart shorn material. Which is, you know, for people like us, all of us probably on this call, wonderful stuff. So first thing I started to do, one of the first things was look through, you can see here, Richard Hartshorn, his book from 1685 um, and, you know, interesting in its own right. And then I saw, and this is what started my journey, a little note uh, among the, all the many pieces of paper in those files that said that he was a son of William Hartshorn, born in 1641, as he could say. And then it's curious, isn't it? He wrote this, he says, on the bottom of 1704, but he couldn't remember where he was born. He says, at a town called Heathcombe or Hatham or Hallerton, and uh, he knew it was in Leicestershire, uh, so that was good. Um, and I didn't know where it was, but he left us some pretty good clues as well. He at least remembered the directions from some towns, four miles from here and two miles from there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I did a little triangulation on a map, um, and sure enough, as you would suspect, it wasn't that hard to find. Uh, between uh, Derbyshire and uh, Loughborough. And there's a little Hathard, which I had never heard of. And so while I was looking at this, I thought, you know what? I need to go there. And I hadn't been in England in a number of years. And I thought, I don't know much about the uh, Hartshorns except what I know on this side of the Atlantic. It would be interesting to find out about them and their origins. So that's what I did. And I planned a trip and spent a couple of weeks over there. And I was lucky I dodged the train strikes that were going on last year and took trains everywhere. And you're going to be the beneficiaries tonight, I hope, of some of the things I learned. So first of all, uh, this is, believe it or not, uh, Richard Hartzler. And that is in a wonderful book that um, they have at, uh, in the Freehold Library as well uh, with Dana. Somebody in their family years ago put together a genealogy uh, compilation and had these sketches of everyone, including, I hope this is accurate, Richard Hartshorn, who I had never seen a picture of. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and he looks pretty elegant to me, uh, as opposed to the kind of rough hewn character I thought I might experience. Um, by the way, I think you all know this, but when I was growing up summers in the Highlands, we always called it Hartshorn. And as you can tell from their coat of arms, it's really heart's horn because a heart in uh, Great Britain and England is a deer. And so the family at some point in its history was named after the horns on a deer. Uh, and oh, by the way, if your Latin's as rusty as mine, up top, tout pressed means quite ready. So whatever they were ready for, who knows? But uh, with the heraldic chivalry there, they would probably be ready for anything, at least in their mind. So um, we do know this um, uh, about Richard. He shows up in 1669, so he's a pretty young man, in um, Newport, Rhode Island. 
Uh, and this is very common, by the way, for the folks coming from England during what was called the uh, the Great Puritan Migration. A lot of them either stopped in um, or started their American sojourn in the Massachusetts Bay Colony or sometimes New uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and then made their way down toward us or both, uh, depending upon who they were, of course. So um, we do know that uh, you know, a dozen years later, well, 10 years later, roughly, he winds up leasing, so-called, some Navasink land from the Lenapes. And, you know, I think we're all probably familiar with that, and it seemed like a typical immigrant story uh, to me. Um, you might know, of course, that at one point, and he had a number of properties that he was buying and leasing, uh, he bought over 4,000 acres, which included a lot of what is today's highlands, Quartz Hearts on Woods, and also the entirety of Sandy Hook, uh, which was a little bit shorter in those days, of course. And there it is. And so, as you also, I think, know, through its history, although the lighthouse is probably somewhere here now, it's extended itself, the literal drift of the sand, um, and it's been an island at various times over the years, too. But Richard Hartshorn, when he got here, uh, and owned all of this part of uh, that peninsula was uh, pretty had a pretty good view, right? Overlooking this huge expanse of land. Um, and he dies in 1722, but his descendants own that land for the better part of the next 200 and almost 300 years, as I think you know as well. So it's pretty famous. Um, and I think anybody in this part of the world knows that much at least, um, but I wanted to know more. I wanted to know, you know, who are these people, where are they come from and that kind of thing. So what I did was, of course, I uh, went over there and before I got there, I took a couple of couple of uh, looks at maps and uh, Hathorne is this little tiny village north of uh, London. There it is on a uh, kind of a Google Earth thing. And you could see, uh, and I experienced this, that it's still pretty, uh, you know, suburban, if you will. Uh, a lot of fields still there. So I imagine, although a lot of this woodland has been cut down in the 400 years since you left, um, a lot of it has retained some of its, uh, some of its English charm. And um, I was delighted to find that out. So as you see here, um, I think in this particular case, I took a train and then a little bus from my state in Loughborough, which is down the road here and spent the day up in Hathorne walking around and having a really good time. So on the bottom right, that's an old, I'm guessing, end of the uh, 19th century image of uh, Hathorne. And if you look up on the left when I when I got there, my bus that day, um, although the buildings are a little bit different, it's not a whole lot change. Um, I don't think they have, I think there's one thatched roof left in town, uh, but it's still a very, very charming little place. And I had written ahead of time to the Historic Society and was going to meet a guy there who knew a lot about his town and uh, obviously the, uh, the uh, Hartshorn family as well. So um, as I mentioned before, and I will mention again, turns out that um, Richard was the son, even though he said William, I had seen this in one of the biblical uh, inscriptions in the local churches there, that he was the son of you and Catherine Robottom or Robottom, depending on how they, how they uh, pronounced it, uh, in that, in Catherine. So um, it turns out to be an astonishingly old village as most of Europe is, of course. And it goes way, way back and has had iterations of who was in charge over the years. Uh, this is, one of the many plaques they have throughout town, which is kind of cool. Um, and there's my contact. I met Anthony White, who's the head of their historic society, who knows a lot about uh, the history of the town. He was raised there, spent his whole, spent, still still there. Um, there is, uh, there he is standing in front of one of the thatched roof houses, which he believes is the manor house in Hathorne. Manor house meaning not the grand eloquent house we may think of today, but where the you know the principal landowner over the years had uh, had lived. Now he hasn't proved that yet, but uh, it was a good place for us to start. 
and we had a lovely afternoon together. He, you know, gave me a lot of information. We walked around town and we stayed in touch for, uh, still, still are in touch actually for, uh, you know, his own purposes, of course. Now, I, you know, like probably a lot of you, are just thrilled to see old villages in especially England. Um, there's the local Episcopal Church. Um, of course, the, uh, the, the hearth, hearth, uh, Hartshorns, I'm sorry, were probably Church of England folks originally, uh, but by the time Richard gets here, he's full-blown Quaker. Uh, whether or not they became Society of Friends over there, I, I am not quite sure. Um, but one of the most interesting parts of the uh, little village that I visited was this. And in Europe, those of you who've been there know this, of course, at central points, intersections, etc., there's some kind of monument, usually a cross. And this one apparently dates back hundreds and hundreds of years, which I knew about before I went over there uh, when I did a little research trying to find uh, out about the town. And they believe uh, in the histories I've read that at one point there was a cross on top of this monument and it has stood there, you know, for the better part of six or seven hundred years. So I imagine they want to believe anyway that Richard himself might have wandered around town before he came to uh, to America, have actually been there and sat there. Um, so it gave me kind of a flavor for the kinds of things he might have seen. So. The other curious thing, getting back to America for a second, in the Bible and the other records that the Monmouth County Historical Association has, is this little tiny inscription, which I will blow up here for you. And it says in some Hartshorn's hand that he was born in a town called Shepshead or Sheepshead in the Shire of Leicester. And that was curious to me because how could a guy or his, you know, presumably uh, next generation not know where he was born? So I had to go back and do a little digging at that. And it turns out that depending upon the demarcation of uh, boundaries uh, through the years, Hathard, which is right here, is right next to what I think they pronounce Sheep's Head, but Sheep's Head, uh, basically. So he, you know, whether he was born in Hathorne uh, proper or over here in a district close by, I don't know. Uh, but it is curious how only being in in uh, or out of his home uh, country 30 or 40 years, he's sort of mixing up where he was from, or at least the stories that his relatives are hearing are a little bit mixed up. But regardless, we were in the, in the right neighborhood, so that was important. And I went uh, and took a picture over at... Um, this is really interesting, as you'll see later, too, at this church called St. Botholz in Chef's Head, and it's located about there. And at least in today's geography, it's a pretty substantial village. What it looked like when he was there compared to Hathorne, I don't know. But keep, uh, keep an eye on that name, because that's going to come back in a minute uh, in a curious way. So let's see where I'm clicking. Oh, okay. So you remember this guy, all right? So let's kind of refresh ourselves. Uh, when the Duke of York gave uh, to 24 proprietors, this is after the uh, 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 Monmouth Patent, by the way, 1682, he gave a big bunch of uh, New Jersey land, mixing up things forever, to a bunch of people, including, look down here, Hugh Hartshorn, a citizen and skinner of London. Well, it turns out, that that was Richard's brother, and a skinner, by the way, is a guy that takes animal skins and works in the trade to, you know, render those things into clothing and other uh, and other items. And as you can see here, you was his older brother. And so what this told me was they were not peasants from some little sheep village uh, at all. They were either well-connected or well-educated for their time. Uh, and it also alerted me to the fact that you, since he was older and connected because all these folks are business people in London, friends of the Duke of York, and uh, no doubt the king as well, um, I got a pretty good idea that you said to his brother, you know, you might want to hightail it over to America because there's land for the picking and, you know, we're all connected here. So that was news to me uh, that you uh, was as involved 
and in fact owned all of East Jersey at one point with another guy you're going to recognize in a second. So here's the, what they call, it's a guild basically, the Worshipful Company of Skinners. And they were located in a place called Houndsditch in London. That was their headquarters, for lack of a better word. Uh, and sure enough, guess what? I find that you marry a woman named Jane Tim at a Houndsditch church. And there it is. Another church connected to probably where they're from somehow called St. Bartholdes. I had never heard of that particular saint. I uh, have no idea what the saint is famous for, uh, but it was curious to me that um, that family at least stayed connected um, to that kind of uh, church. Oh, by the way, did you notice, uh, probably not, in the 24 proprietors named by the Duke of York in 1682, one of whom is our famous William Penn, then living at uh, Warminghurst. Um, and yes, indeed, William Penn was um, not only all the things we know him to be on this side of the Atlantic, but he was very much involved in the business community of London. Uh, he was a Quaker that posed its own set of challenges, but a lot of these guys were Quakers too, and businessmen. And oh, by the way, I think you know from, from other sources, they were not abolitionists at this early stage of the Society of Friends. Many of them, including William Penn, were slave owners. So let's talk about some other folks. Uh, we can go on and on, of course, about the heart zones. But I had a goal of trying to find as much as I could about five, at least, I hope, families in the week and a half, two weeks almost that I was over there. And one of our most famous uh, Mammoth County founders, of course, you'll recognize James Grover's name. Um, and the records on this side that we have say he was from Chesham in Buckinghamshire. And a lot of the attributions about him say he was born in 1607 in Chesham, 25 miles northwest of London. But there was a problem with that when I started to think about that. Nonetheless, I went to Chesham on my on my journey, and it's this wonderful little village town, a uh, little market town. You can see here's the main street. I have no idea how many of these homes were there when James Grover was around, uh, but it just has that lovely, lovely English feel. Uh, these kinds of houses clearly were around then. I forget the date on this one, but it was contemporaneous uh, with Grover. And I took this in what they call the old section of town. And these are very, very old homes there, as is the church in town. In fact, I think that church is this church in that old, old sketch. Uh, and then as luck would have it, and it always happens uh, on these trips, I was wandering through town and I decided to stop at this little, you know, quaint looking cafe called the Whatnot Vintage Cafe sat next to these two women and I took their picture. And lo and behold, just totally coincidental, that cafe is now in a building that goes back a long time because the proprietor told me that the guy that owned that building originally was this guy, who was the inspiration for the Mad Hatter. It was a guy named Roger Crabb, believe it or not, who was in fact a hatter who owned that building way back when, and somehow or other, uh, Lewis Carroll, okay, not his real name, uh, was inspired, maybe this guy was infamous, uh, and wrote about him. So there I am sitting appropriately enough at the Mad Hatter's uh, little house for lunch one day. So of no import to what we know about um, any of these folks, but it was fun to, fun to, to uh, experience. The problem with the attribution of James Grover being in born in 1607 that a lot of our local works have said is this. He shows up in Lynn or what is now Savage, Massachusetts in 1637 as an apprentice to James Hubbard. I don't think there were a lot of 37 year, 37, I should say 30 year old apprentices. Um, and so that told me that there was something amiss there. By the way, this is a kayak trip I took last summer up to the Saugus Iron Mill, which Grover, I know now, used as part of the inspiration to bring the Leonards down to the Titten Falls uh, Iron Mill many years later. 
but to get back to Grover. So how could he be 30 years old and an apprentice? It didn't make sense to me. Um, and, you know, I did some sleuthing around both uh, on both sides of the Atlantic and found out that probably a better candidate is this James Grover, who was born a little bit further up country in England, a place called Great Berkhamstead in Herefordshire, uh, because his date of birth of 1621 would make him 16, which is right in the sweet spot of apprentices when they were working in both England and in the colonies here. So that's my my best guess. And off this map, an older map, by the way, Chesham would be way down here off the map. Here is uh, Berkhamstead, which is in another little lovely valley. I did not get to it when I was over there, um, although I had planned to, because something else about James Grover came up that I thought uh, and turned out to be true it was a little bit more interesting. And uh, that was the following. So let's back up a little bit, okay? We know that James Grover starts out in um, up in Lynn, Massachusetts. He uh, is what we call an Anabaptist. He uh, uh, and a number of folks up there who uh, decided, uh, had decided that uh, why should we baptize young babies? They don't have the age of reason. They can't understand anything. Let's wait till they're 12 or 13, therefore they're Anabaptists. And they were led by a very, very important woman named uh, Lady Deborah Moody. And basically they don't get any traction in Lynn uh, and they get drummed out of the colony. And Lady Moody takes a whole bunch of them down looking for a new place to live. They stop at Newport, that didn't work. They stop at Connecticut, that didn't work. And they wind up in Dutch controlled New Amsterdam and Willem Keith says to them, go ahead, go over there in Long Island and um, I'll put you up in this little place there. And where that little place is, is now and still and was called then Gravesend. And this is Brooklyn and this is Coney Island in this old map. And that's what they do. And Grover was one of the many men who went with Lady Moody and her son, by the way, she was a widow. Uh, she was from England, of course, too. And they settled there. Um, and then Grover, you know, gets on his uppers and he does something um, uh, not too cool for the time. Because he's English and because he had left England, went to New England, uh, he is got all his sympathies and his heritage in the English side. And the Dutch and the English, as you know, are always fighting back on the other side of the Atlantic. So James Grover and a couple of people, including Hubbard, um, decide one day in a show of defiance in Gravesend to raise an English flag over their little, you know, not even a square mile of town here uh, with outlying farms. And that gets in a whole world of trouble. And uh, a couple of them get captured, not James Grover. What he does is after the raising of the English flag, a very famous incident, he goes back to Massachusetts books himself on a ship and goes back to England to meet Oliver Cromwell, which is incredible. And why would he do that? Well, because of the animosity between the English and the Dutch, the middle colonies here of New York wasn't, it was actually New Netherlands, uh, New Netherlands then, and especially represented by uh, New Amsterdam, was a thorn in the side of the English, especially Oliver Cromwell. The English were obviously controlling New England and Virginia and South in this new continent, so-called, uh, and it really ticked them off. And Grover knew this, and he went back, and he spent some time in London to try to get to Oliver Cromwell to say, hey, listen, uh, we got this little English outpost here. We know a lot because we've been involved with the Dutch. We know what they do. They're not very well defended in, in um, you know, New Amsterdam here. There's an opportunity. And Oliver Cromwell was, if nothing, an opportunist. And we won't even get into the English Civil Wars, but they were, um, you know, part and parcel of Oliver Cromwell's uh, raison d'etre. So here's where I make a side trip. I decided that I'm going to go up, I find out, to Huntington, which is where Oliver Cromwell's from. Okay, and I do that. And again, the wonderful train system in England affords me that capability. 
couple hours out of London, where I was kind of headquartered for the week I was there, I go up to Huntington and had all kinds of great luck. First of all, it's another little medieval town, now a market town. You can see in this old map, uh, as all of these old towns were, you had rivers and streams and valleys and farmlands all around. Um, but basically, the people clustered inside, uh, of course, these towns. And right here on your left, uh, over the over the plaque, is what is left of the school in Huntington that Oliver Cromwell went to as a young boy. Um, and I say what's left of it because it was a longer edifice at one point, um, but that's where he went to school because that's where he was raised. And I met these two lovely women uh, at the, uh, I, I think of them as the, the Dana Howell of the uh, Oliver Cromwell Museum, uh, pick your choice, which one. Um, and they were wonderful. And I identified myself uh, pretty easy to do when I opened my mouth as an American. And they gave me all kinds of great information about Oliver Cromwell. They did not know a lot about, if anything, frankly, about James Grover, uh, but put me in touch with one of the premier scholars of Oliver Cromwell in England who teaches at Cambridge. Uh, so, you know, it was just um, a serendipitous moment for me. I'll put it that way. Um, and here is the guy, uh, John Morell, who is this wonderful scholar. And they gave me his email address and I wrote to him when I got back home because he had written, has written continually about Oliver Cromwell. And I shared with him what I knew about Grover's interactions with Cromwell. And we had a nice repartee for a while. So again, just a really interesting stroke of luck for me. Now, as it turns out, um, I don't know specifically, I could never determine if James Grover specifically spoke to Oliver Cromwell, but I do know that while he was in England, he did speak with John Thurlow, who happened to be Cromwell's secretary, if you will, and his kind of right-hand person, the entirety of the latter part of the uh, Civil War. So Grover got to Thurlow in London um, and was pitching the idea that, hey, you know, there's an opportunity to take over from the Dutch over here, and I'm well connected, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously Grover's, Grover's got a couple of motives here. Now, he might or might not have known this, but John Thurlow had just written something called A Brief Narration of the English Rights to the Northern Parts of America. So what's that about? Well, you remember that Dutch put their claim to basically what is New York and New Jersey based on Henry Hudson's voyage over here in 1609 when uh, he landed actually in uh, what is now Atlantic Islands Harbor. Uh, and so the Dutch, as well, uh, the Europeans decided that they now own this land, completely ignoring the folks that were living here, the Lenapes. But when Grover pitches his deal to Thurlow, you believe he's got a, an eager ear. Um, and, you know, you would also believe that Thurlow is talking to Cromwell about this English colonist who's coming over here giving us all this intelligence. Um, and so what does he do? He gives, and when I say Cromwell, it might have been Thurlow, but certainly Cromwell would have approved it, a letter to James Grover to bring back to the folks in Gravesend, the English citizens there, to encourage them to keep doing what they're doing. And the letter has this wonderful phrase in it called, uh, uh, he wrote it to the English who are well-affected inhabitants on Long Island. Little background on that, England controlled the eastern end of Long Island owing to something called the um, Treaty of Hartford. The western end was Dutch controlled, except for this little outpost of uh, Gravesend and a couple of other little villages. And after Willem Kieft uh, was actually kicked out, Stuyvesant, uh, as you know, uh, is in charge of new, uh, the New Netherlands and certainly the Dutch uh, West India Company at what is now New York. And so he was wary of the English, they were wary of him. And this all comes together in the person of our James Grover. So, of course, when I get back to London, I've got to go to Parliament and see if I can find out anything about this letter. And again, a lucky for me, before I left, a friend of mine, some of you know, named Rick Van Hemmen, 
put me in touch with this guy. And this guy with me is Barry Gardner, who's a member of parliament, who gave me the most incredible tour. And there we are standing, by the way, in uh, Westchester Hall, uh, I'm sorry, Westminster Hall, uh, that's, uh, you know, about 1500 years old. But he took me into, you'll know, pardon the expression, the bowels of parliament in the parts of the building that tourists don't normally see. And luckily for me, he's a historian in his own right. And just took me everywhere, including we sat at the at the uh, the uh, the you know parliament where they when they were in session that we've all seen on TV. That was kind of cool. Um, and so he also put me in touch with the librarian of uh, parliament to see if I could run down some of these old documents, and, and that brought some some nice food as well. But on a personal level, two really cool things happened to me. That was one of them, by the way. The second was. Across the street, and some of you who've been to London, especially to the Parliament building, know this. Across the street, as I was walking into, oh, by the way, the Cromwell Gate, is this, this little St. Mary's Chapel, which I knew and recognized and went in because my great grandmother was baptized there. So, you know, it was serendipity on top of serendipity for me. So it was just, just kind of cool. Um, and oh, by the way, you remember the original Jersey Boys, don't you? Uh, Berkeley and Carteret. Um, no, they were not there. Um, and I'm lying to you because, of course, I took that picture of myself as a joke. Uh, but recall that Berkeley and Carteret were granted um, a lot of what was, in fact, all of what, it, what was New Jersey. And they split it into east and west precisely because they were at the Isle of Jersey after which our state is named as supporters of the royal, uh, the royalty as against Cromwell and the parliamentarians. So what I'm portraying here is, I hope what a lot of you know anyway, we all tend to think of our history as, oh, they got here and then everything happened. Well, everything is playing in parallel on the other side of the Atlanta, particularly when it comes to the Dutch and the English who are always feuding. Uh, and it's fascinating for me at least, to, to find out these strands of, of information. And there, as you know, are a couple of very famous faces. This is the Duke of York in another, another very, very interesting image. And here is purportedly at least Richard Nichols, who he sends over with a fleet of four English ships into uh, what is then uh, New Amsterdam Harbor. Uh, Peter Stuyvesant throws up his hands, gives up the entirety, of uh, New Netherland um, without a shot being fired. And shortly thereafter, the, the what was called originally the Navasink or now Mammoth Patent, which is just a deed, is given by Nichols to these 12 guys who are living in Gravesend, most of them, but most especially our friend James Grover. So you can see that uh, Grover was working both sides of the street, okay, he's connected uh, and he knows very well that if he's spokesman over there and comes back here with all the news, uh, things are going to change and break in his favor. And of course they do. So you'll recall that that was the original Mammoth patent uh, demarcation. Goes way up here, starts way up here, and then comes down one of, and I think you know too, that these demarcation lines between East and West Jersey there were at least four attempts at trying to define them. Um, but a couple of things stick out in this map, I hope. That's where Gravesend is in Long Island. And when these men were coming over and populating Monmouth County, it was a very short, you know, half day at best, uh, you know, riding a sloop across, across the harbor. And it's this immense tract of land, as you can see, ending, coincidentally enough for me today, in Little Egg Harbor. That was the kind of pivot point for all of what becomes Monmouth County. And I say that uh, today because I was down there this afternoon giving a talk at the Little Lake Harbor um, Library. And I told them uh, and uh, made sure they understood that they were Monmouth County people no matter what they think. Of course, facetiously, roughly around here, Ocean County breaks away in 1850. But you see how all these strands are coming together uh, around uh, James Grover in particular. 
So, also while I was in London, I had the great good fortune to be, and this was absolutely dumb luck, where I stayed uh, in a hotel as my base was around the corner from the British Library, which is you know one of the premier libraries in the world. I spent some time there. It was around the corner from St. Pancras, which is a major train station that got me everywhere I wanted to go. And then to my delight, it is also around the corner from, as you see, the Friends House of Quakers in Britain, where they hold all the records that they can possibly garner. And I went there to specifically look up some things about William Penn. And to my great delight, when I went down, one of the archivists, another Dana imitator, says to me, you know, what else are you interested in? I said, well, I'd be interested in if, if you had anything about Lewis Morris. And as you are hope seeing here on the screen, they brought up the original, this is obviously my photo, of a letter written in 1675 by, yes, our Lewis Morris, who is uh, alleged to have named Monmouth County after his home in Monmouthshire, Wales. And this letter that he hand wrote was from, if you look here, Barbados. And in the letter, he's doing a couple of things. And what he, and I just extracted this part for you, he says, I'm, and this is his spelling, I am almost ready to go on board for New York. So I'm in a great hash, meaning he's all discombobulated and he's getting ready to leave Barbados and he and his brother Richard's sugar plantations. Of course, his brother Richard had died a few, a few years before. But this is the journey on which he brings up 60 to 70 of his Barbadian sugar slaves, sugar plantation slaves, to first New York, to Marsania that he heard it from his brother. And then, as I think you all know, to Tinton Falls, where he buys from James Grover what becomes the Tinton Falls Ironworks and that huge, huge plantation. Uh, and here I am um, looking at the original handwritten letter that I never knew existed, of course. Uh, again, just, just terrific luck for me. So again, as I mentioned, he brings over all of these enslaved folks, including a man that we know a lot about because he writes about this personal servant, AKA slave named Yaf. And just to give you a, a sense of it, here is the Tinton Manor Colonel Lewis Morris script in a probably the original sketch of where he had what became the ironworks. This is a bridge about where the bridge is today, more or less across what you and I call Pine Brook now. Um, and this was done by uh, obviously a, a surveyor for Colonel Morris. And as I think you recall, he was there because this was the largest natural waterfall at that point in the 17th century of any save the great Patterson Falls up in northern New Jersey. And he wanted the power. He needed the water power to turn the wheels to his mills, uh, not only as part of what he was doing mining bog iron, but later on for grain and timber and everything else. Um, and so you see the connections here of James Grover, who actually started uh, his attempt here because he bought land from the Lenapes, but he and his two partners, uh, including Richard Hartzorn, did not make a go of it. They mortgaged the property and eventually it comes into Lewis Morris's hands. And he does all the things that we all know about now. He's also, as you can tell from this number, uh, in the 1670s, Lewis Morris, this man, is the largest enslaver in East Jersey by the nature of these folks. And then, of course, others that they had, um, uh, other slaves that were born there. So, not only is that letter showing up again, which I didn't want to do, uh, but I wanted to tell you that he brings these folks up because they had learned their skills, either being uh, transported directly from Africa or in, in some likelihood when they got to Barbados, they had children 
who are forced to work in the fields as well. Um, and as I'm sure you understand, um, you know, working in sugarcane fields in tropical heat uh, is the last thing on earth you want to be doing. Uh, and the rates of death and injury were horrendous. But from a Lewis Morris perspective, a slaveholder perspective, perspective, bringing these skilled workers up into his Morrisania in the Bronx now, uh, plantation as well as Titan Falls, they're invaluable to him. Uh, he did have, as this picture is, of course, made up, but he did have white overseers, including James Grover, for a while. Those records also are at, and they're wonderful to watch and see, uh, are still at the uh, Freehold um, uh, Monmouth County Stoke Association. The original handwritten ledgers, I believe even by Lewis Morris from the Titan uh, Falls Ironworks. Um, and okay, so I gave you a double slide by mistake. But now I'm back to where I want to be. Yath is important for a couple of reasons. One is that in the last will of Lewis Morris in 1691, which I'm sorry, I don't have here extracted. Uh, Dana, is this, is this last will page that come up? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Uh, anyway, it's a long 14 or 15 page document because Lewis Morris at his death is the richest man in East Jersey. And in here, he says he, begin, he gives a bequeath unto his honored friend, William Penn, his servant, Yath. That's the William Penn that you and I know. And that's Yath, who had been with Lewis Morris in Barbados in almost another 20 years up here, 15 years anyway, in Titan Falls. And I knew before I got over there and wanted to find out more, because in a letter back when Penn leaves eventually for the last time to go back to England. He writes back to his secretary here, James Logan in Philadelphia saying, listen, Yaf is also God. He's been with me four years. That's how I know that he got Yaf in 1699 from Lewis Morris's heir, Lewis Morris, same name, who was his nephew and becomes governor of New Jersey. So Yaf is with Penn in Philadelphia for you know the better part of four years. He brings him back, frees him when he gets to this place. I leave it for him to return from Deal. He's talking about Deal in England. And he also mentions, does William Penn, Yaf is an able planter and he good, he's a good husbandsman and promises fair. What he's saying here is this guy's talented. Yaf obviously speaks several languages. Okay. He knows the, you know, the high and the mighty in the colonies, and now he's going up, uh, going over to England. Uh, he's obviously a clever guy. He knows his way around the fields and animals. Um, and for whatever reasons, William Penn decides to free him and leave him at this town called Deal. You'll recognize that name, of course. Um, and he also says in this letter back to James Logan, I'll leave it up to Yaf if he wants to go back to America, a.k.a. Titan Falls, which I don't think he would want to because he was enslaved there uh, and there's no further documentation. But I wanted to find out. And so I knew this. I knew that Penn came back in 1699 and did acquire Yaf. And I knew that, as you uh, we just talked about, he took him back to London but he doesn't go to London with Yaf as Penn did, because remember, Penn's a businessman besides a Quaker. What he does is he leaves him off at Kent in southern England at Deal, as you saw. And why does he do that? Well, here's the Thames. Okay. So if you're coming up from America, you're coming down from the bottom, you know, left here on my screen, and you're stopping here in an area called the Downs. It's a natural seaport where ships you know, to Europe or to America and back and forth are stopping to refresh their provisions at Deal before they either go up the River Thames or wherever they're going. So I know that Penn stops overnight. I think he probably says to Yaf, supervise these guys, go get some more supplies, bring it back to me on ship. I'm going up to London, do what you want. And this is a fairly contemporaneous uh, view of what a uh, deal in Kent looked like in those days. It's a little seaboard town. 
And you could see all the ships out here in this very natural harbor, which is why they stayed there. So, oh, by the way, our deal here in Monmouth County was named after Thomas White, who comes from their deal in 1675. Now, that's the full-blown map, or I should say drawing, of what Deal Kent looked around the end of the 17th century. And uh, when I went there on purpose, I walked the waterfront, took that picture, and it doesn't look a whole lot different, okay, along the waterfront. And oh, by the way, their beaches are pebbles of, you know, kind of pretty good fist-sized rocks, so it's a lot different than ours. Um, and I also went by this fort, which had been built by Henry VIII to defend, whoop, sorry, can't do it the right way. Uh, I should have taken that off there. But in any event, um, the fort was built by Henry VIII as one of the many, many forts along the southern and eastern coast of England to defend against the French, the Dutch, and anybody else. Um, and although you can't see it for some reason, because I don't know how to work uh, slideshows anymore, uh, I visited that, that very castle. And I wanted to pretend and to think about what Yaff might be thinking. Penn leaves in there. What's he thinking? I think he's in his late 50s. He's obviously a skilled guy. He speaks English very well after all these years. He's probably looking to make a, a livelihood for himself, and he's maybe looking to hire himself out in town. And so I walked around the town uh, trying to figure out, as best I could recreate, what a Black man who had been enslaved most of his life suddenly thinks and feels and uh, how he looks about for opportunity. And I walked down what they call still today Middle Street. And here's a very old image of it. That hasn't changed a whole lot. That would be a very gray, rainy day when I walked down these streets, nobody about. So I got this kind of cool feel for what it might have been. I can easily picture him either knocking on doors or trying to get some work for himself. Uh, yeah, um, maybe he had, I would hope he would have some kind of note from William Penn um, attesting to his freedom, uh, and also maybe some recommendation letters. Uh, maybe for all I know, Yaff went up to London and met Penn again. Uh, we just don't have any documentation that surfaced to date. Uh, one of the delightful things that I did when I walked along the waterfront, I came across here the Admiral Penn Inn in Deal. Now, that is named after William Penn's father, Sir uh, Admiral William Penn, as well. Um, and what's ironic about that, at least to me, was that around the corner from the Admiral Penn Hotel, named after a very famous uh, admiral in their Navy, right around the corner on Market Street, right about here, is the site of an old Quaker meeting house. And if you know anything about the Penns, you'll know that the father and son William Penns had a big falling out. Uh, because, you know, the Admiral was a staunch Church of England guy, and Quakers were radical and crazy people, and there were years when they father and son did not talk. So I just found, found it ironic that uh, the, the William Penn Hotel, the Admiral Penn Inn would be around the corner from the Quaker meeting. But maybe that's just my sense of humor. Um, Yaff is an amazing story in and of himself, right? Uh, this is a kind of a short version, but basically we think from all we can tell that he was probably born in the Senegambia region, now Senegal and Gambia on the western coast of Africa, when all the European shipping companies are coming down and buying slaves from other Africans, by the way. Um, we know that in that time frame, he winds up in Barbados. When I say he winds up, whether or not Yaf's parents wind up there and he's born in Barbados or not is undetermined at this point. But we know that he spends the better part of 20 years in Barbados. Uh, and he must have stood out from the other enslaved people because Lewis Morris takes him into his house and he becomes his trusted, he calls him servant. Uh, about that year, he winds up going up to New York and then later on Tinton Falls with Lewis Morris, and he spends a good number of years there. And then around 1699, not shown here, 
he gets turned over to William Penn, who in 1703 brings him back to England. So think about this. This young African, he had to be a boy at the beginning of all this, whether born in Africa or Barbados, who knows. He has met founding fathers of our country, important personages in our own personal story here in Monmouth County in New Jersey. And his travels are beyond what he ever could have imagined, beyond what Europeans mostly could have imagined in those days. Of course, only the wealthy are doing any kind of traveling like this. So we're lucky that we have the little documentation that we do about this man. Uh, and I'm hoping that someday more will, will surface. Um, and there he winds up, lest we lose track of him, is in Deal uh, in Kent. So I had to, of course, uh, go up and see what happened to old William Penn. Uh, William Penn gets back to England. By the way, he's broke for most of his life. Terrible businessman. Uh, he didn't make very much money at all from his colonies here, uh, uh, Pennsylvania in particular, because he was slicing and dicing up the land and selling it to people who then refused to pay quit rents and everything else to him. Uh, and he had a devil of a time making any money. Um, spends time in his early years, by the way, in debtor's prison. But he's a Quaker um, and uh, uh, apparently a very, very moral Quaker in a lot of ways although we know now that he also was, like so many of those folks, a slaveholder too. Why he freed uh, Yaf, uh, unknown. Uh, I'd like to think that Yaf was such a superior person and such a personal young guy, or probably a middle-aged guy at that point, uh, that William Penn saw the humanity that he may not have in other enslaved people. But to get back to this, uh, at a place called Jordan's, uh, another nice train ride from where I was staying in England. I went up there one day because I knew about these images of the Quaker meeting house up there. And there it is still to this day. And I visited the graves, maybe, of William Penn and his two wives. One of his wives died, you may know. And then uh, when he came back with his second wife to uh, England, um, and she passed away after him. They were all buried there. Now, when I say maybe, it's because nobody quite knows, they tell me there, where his exact resting place is. It's somewhere here. Regardless, these uh, stones of the pens have been there for a long time. Uh, but it's a, it's a pretty big um, graveyard. And as you probably do know from even here down in, in, uh, in Shrewsbury, Quakers weren't necessarily big on putting monuments over their graves. Uh, I don't know when these particular uh, stones were put in place, but uh, at least they're not necessarily over the actual graves of William Penn. Um, but I paid my homage and felt pretty good about it uh, because Penn is central to a lot of our stories here in New Jersey and even Monmouth County. So um, having, having run this far so far, um, I didn't get to a few places I wanted to get. I wanted to get to uh, Dorchester, um, which is in Devonshire on the kind of Cornwall coast off to the southwest of London to find out about the Lippincotts and maybe the Corleys family. But uh, if you all send in really nice notes tonight to Dana, maybe she'll invite me back to talk about uh, those and it'll give me an excuse to go over to England again and and have the kind of fun that I like to have, um, incorporating research and all this other kind of stuff. So that's my little part of my little sojourn uh, uh, to England. There's a lot more that would take uh, much, much more time than we all have. So with that data, uh, you want to either open up the microphones or read questions. I'd be happy to, uh, to talk to people about anything. Um, and by the way, corrections, to what I have stated are always welcome. I don't pretend to know everything about everything. So um, please talk about anything you feel that's worth sharing. Yeah, sure. So you want me to invite you back, but you're off traveling the world, visiting other archivists. Is that, and I'm I've not supposed on, to be jealous, I have, right? I have in fact been unfaithful to your archival self, yes. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think we're fighting now, Rick. Oh, okay, okay, well. <laughs> It's, it's uh, the holiday coming up. I'll get you a nice present. We'll make it up. 
So I looked it up real quick when you were talking about St. Bot Botolf. Bot Bot Botolf, yeah, however you pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, right? Boundaries. He's a patron saint of boundaries, trade and travel, and various aspects of farming. So How was, cool is that? that yeah, trade and awesome. travel. There you go. That's pretty cool. That is very cool. Um, And I loved the uh, the Roger Crabb house. That's like How a, cool was that? Alice in Wonderland. So that I had no idea that that existed. That was a very cool. That was, I mean, thing. I certainly wasn't looking for it. I just stumbled into a place to eat lunch and the owner told me this story. I hope it's true because I'm yeah. telling it. True. <laughs> okay. So let's see. Um, who's got questions? Put them in the chat if you've got questions. 134 Jersey people. There's got to be questions. Yeah, well, you were up to 150, just so you know. Yeah, well, they drop off after we started fighting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's funny. I don't know. I think sometimes, like, when you don't have questions, you did a really thorough job. You kind of touched or on put them, the or I put them to, answered the questions. Put them to sleep, one or the other, right? You never know. <laughs> I don't think anybody's sleeping. <laughs> But you got a very nice compliment from Claire. I don't know if it came to you or if it just came to me, but she said I haven't seen it. I haven't seen a thing. She said, Oh, it, it's not coming into you. The the uh yeah, I don't have it on that. You know, I could let me see. Let me do chat. There it is. Okay, I can do it. Uh okay. I see is okay. So somebody, Michael Clear is asking, is the location of the Tin Falls Eye Works the same where MJ's is now? Uh that whole area, in fact, you're exactly right. Um, we just put up a plaque there at the Titten Falls Historic Society. Uh, Stacy Solinsky, who was the head of that great organization, uh, acknowledging the enslaved folks that were there. But that whole area around the New Bridge, of course, was all owned originally by the Lenapes, then by Grover and uh, Applegate and Hartshorn, and then Lewis Morris. But by the time Lewis Morris gets a hold of it, it's about 3,400 acres. He expands it, the nephew does anyway, to about 6,400 acres. But yes, right there along the Pine Brook, um, which is a tributary of the Swimming River, is where all of that iron uh, work, uh, ironworks uh, uh, mechanisms are going on. Morris County and Morristown, great question. And the answer is yes and no. So here's the way this works. When Lewis Morris, the nephew, gets uh, uh, elected or actually appointed to become the first royal governor of New Jersey in uh, 1738, the people up in Huntington County, New Jersey, say, hey, Lou, we got an idea. We're thinking of splitting part of our county off and named it after you. What do you think? So, uh, and I'm paraphrasing. So, of course, he does. Uh, but the Morris family has very little to do with Morristown, Morris Plains, Morris County, and all of that, although it was named as a kind of a political favor to uh, to Lewis Morris. So that's a, a really uh, good observation there. Thank you, Robin, as well. Let's see what else I got. Anything Hang about on. Um, so hold on one second. I have Gary, um, Gary Soretsky. He's asking. Oh, Hi, Gary Soretsky. <laughs> I haven't seen him in two weeks. Yeah. Oh, two whole weeks. Wow. Whole He's weeks. asking if you've ever found any uh, Morris descendants and uh, uh, you know, I have Morris's actually. slaves descendant. I'm sorry. Hold on one second. I'm any descendants of Morris's enslaved persons. So, OK, so as we all know, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, especially, there's a lot of Morris's. And in fact, the Morris historic family that we're talking about went on to great things, including writing parts and fact, the preamble of our uh, constitution was written by Governor Morris, a descendant, and Morrises are all over New Jersey and New York history. So that's the famous Morrises, many of whom I do not, if any of them, know. But right, I have- He's asking about the enslaved. That's a, that's a tough one. Right. I have met white Morris descendants who claim they're from that family. I hope that's true. Mm -hmm. But I believe and have not, because of the difficulty you can imagine, uh, uh, of tracing somebody back that far. I have not yet found anybody who self-identifies or I, I've been able to point to as a descendant of any of the enslaved at Titan Falls. There's no record, and that doesn't mean it didn't happen, there's no record that Yap was ever married, and if he had been, that would have been a powerful incentive for him to come back here. No record of that, no record of children, that doesn't mean he didn't have any. Certainly, the other enslaved people had children, 
I know, and you all probably know, I'm sure Gary knows, that in the Pine Brook section, what used to be called Macedonia uh, in um, Monmouth County, there was a, and still is, an historic black community that goes way back to the Lenape days when they intermarried. Uh, and my best guess, and that's all it is, is that over time, if some of these enslaved folks at the Morris, uh, Titton Falls area were either free or ran away, uh, they may have been more close to that place than not. Uh, but it's very, very tough. And, you know, in the next several years, uh, as DNA gets better, uh, and other sources come online, which they are increasingly every day, but we may be able to identify some of those people. Uh, but to date, I haven't certainly, and I'm no expert on that anyway. Um, so, uh, Lori wants to know, is there a slave cemetery in Tin Falls? Yes, there is. It's right next to, uh, the, uh, what we all call the Crawford House, which is the, uh, the Crawford family, but it's on the site of Tin Falls. That's where the Tin Falls Historic Society has its meetings. Right next to that in a circular driveway, is what uh, Rich White and other archaeologists have thought. Um, and there's a sign there now that it is likely, although never proven, to be the graveyard of the enslaved who passed away. And there would have been a lot of them because it was brutal work no matter what they do, were doing. Uh, and I'm sure it wasn't a graveyard like we think about, God forbid, but it might even a mass grave uh, over the years. Certainly, there are no remnants of stones or crosses. They wouldn't have had crosses likely in the early days anyway. They weren't Christian. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, they're buried there somewhere. So that's an excellent, an excellent question. As are, by the way, enslaved people all over Monmouth County and New Jersey, including, uh, you probably all know about the Cedar View Cemetery next to St. Leo the Great in Lincroft. That's a black historic cemetery uh, that I'm on the board of the committee that, that helped revitalize it. There are former slaves buried in that, we know by document. So uh, they're all over our county for the simple reason that there were thousands of enslaved people here owned by hundreds of Monmouth County people. So uh, that's a sad legacy that we have to deal with. So let's see who else is leaving. Robin waved to me and then she left. That's good. Uh, anybody else have a question here? Oh, what about the Grover Sloop encounter with the Dutch in Raritan Bay? Good question, Eddie. Um, I think I know who Eddie is. That's got to do with uh, right before the um, uh, the English came in in 1664, 65, and the Mammoth patent was granted. Grover and a bunch of other guys from Graves and uh, Graves and get in a sloop, and they're on this secret mission to come down here to meet the Navasink Indians to buy land. The Dutch get because it's still Dutch controlled territory. The Dutch get wind of this. They chase them in a sloop. They catch them up the Raritan River. The next time you go over the bridges, look to your left. You'll see Crab Island. That's where they uh, we think they met the Indians. And the Dutch come up and they almost come to. Uh, to exchanging uh, shots, which they don't. And basically the Dutch say to Grover and these other people, what are you doing? And of course, good good English people that they are, they lie. They say, oh, we're just trading with the Indians, uh, which it wasn't what they were doing at all. They were trying to buy land. And then they dodge that encounter. They have another encounter with them in probably the Highlands area. Uh, again, no shots are fired, but the Dutch say, go back home, get out of here. Um, and it might have been one of the reasons that uh, perhaps um, James Grover was man enough to go over and talk to Thurlow and Cromwell about, hey, uh, let's get these Dutch out of here, um, which we all know did happen. So that's a really good question about that. By the way, a lot of this stuff, you don't need me to hear. You can look at uh, many, many famous uh, historical works about Monmouth County, all of which I'm happy to tell you are under the guiding hand of Dana, who, if I'm lucky one day, will talk to me again. <laughs> uh, let's see. At the time, Mama County extended to Egg Harbor. wasn't, at that time, a large Swedish section. Yeah, great, great question. In fact, one of the people who bought land from the Lenape's down there was a guy named 
Hendrik Falkenberg, who uh, might have been Swedish, he was married at least to a Swedish woman. The Swedes tried to colonize the lower Delaware early on, uh, especially around, uh, you know, we, you and I call Newcastle today and all those things on the Delaware side. But they had little outposts along the lower Delaware River. Um, this particular guy I'm talking about, Falkenberg, actually started in Burlington uh, when he first came over. And in about 1688, he winds up buying land from the Lenape's in Little Egg Harbor. He's fluent in Lenape, apparently he took a different view than most of the colonists did, was very, very friendly with them, uh, and apparently got along very well. Um, but uh, Little Lake Harbor um, is, as I mentioned, the pivot point. The other western border and the northern border of, of what becomes Monmouth County shift a bit, but um, Little Lake Harbor is right there where it's also. Let's see, have I done any research on families that inhabit Western Monmouth County? Great question. I, I did hear about one time that there are people that do live in Western County. Um, and I do know some of them, including John Fabiano, who's done a lot of research uh, out in Allentown. Uh, and I do it occasionally when, increasingly, by the way, too, uh, my research just take me out that way. Uh, as you would expect, the coastal areas were settled, I don't want to say first, but pretty predominantly in the early days of our county. And then people, especially the Scots in the northwest part of the county, uh, and then uh, into the other areas down by Crossing Creek, et cetera, uh, they start to go in there as well. Uh, but if you do have, uh, Catherine, any particular question about somebody you know out there, you could certainly shoot me an email, which I think my Hopefully, uh, once again, friend Dana will put into the chat box so anybody can get a hold of me. And if I have information yeah, sure. on who you're looking about, I will uh, be happy to send it to you. I'm trying to uh, get it to everybody, but... Hmm. All right, so those of you who have good memories, unlike me, it's Rick G uh, 0817 at yahoo.com. And Oliver Tallman at Titten Falls. Uh, I don't know Oliver, but the Tallman family is a huge family of, by the way, slaveholders in Monmouth County who are all over Shrewsbury. And unless you know something which is likely, Kathy, about Oliver more than I do, I don't recall that name in particular. But again, shoot an email and what I've got about, a, I think it's a 16,000 name uh, database now of Monmouth County folks. And if I have any of uh, Oliver Tall, uh, Tallman, I'll be sure to send it to you. What's your email again, Rick? Rick G? Rick G0817. Mm -hmm. at, Yahoo. at Yahoo? Right. And I do, okay. by the way, love to answer those emails because you all tell me a lot of stuff that makes me go down these uh, research paths that I enjoy. And um, you all probably know your local history more, uh, I hope you do, your family history more, uh, more uh, in-depth than I can. Uh, and it's it's wonderful for those of you who have deep roots in Monmouth County and uh, uh, can contribute. I'm looking at a name here, and I won't embarrass you, uh, Mandy, uh, but your last name is very familiar to me um, from Rumson, if you're part of that family. And that's a really important family as well. Um, the other folks I won't pick out by name and embarrass them. <laughs> um, although, the, no, no, I won't do anyway. it. Um, let's see if anybody else has got questions while they have me. Somebody was asking if uh, Lippincott was a Quaker. I actually, I don't uh, know that. Yeah, the Quakers, the Lippincotts were. In fact, if you go to the um, Parker House in uh, Little Silver, mm -hmm. they have a book that I've seen and held, and it's thrilling for me anyway, uh, with the signature of Remembrance Lippincott, and I think it was 1713, um, and it's a Quaker book of some kind. Um, and yes, a lot of the Lippincotts, as well as uh, the Parkers, were Quakers, uh, and also to our chagrin, a lot of them were slaveholders. Mm -hmm. um, so Certainly look up online, the Parker House. I think they call it, what do they call it? Parker House 1657 or something? Parker Homestead, yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. um, 
to talk to Keith there, uh, who I think is still president, and he can, uh, mm -hmm. he can help. My friend Tom Valenti's asked me if I uh, researched John Bound. Yes. And the problem with the Bound family is, as you know, there's a lot of them and a lot of John Bounds. Um, and depending on which one you're talking about, Tom, I may have a lot or a little or nothing. So send me an email and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you what I, what I have about, about the Bound family. Um, I am a descendant, Catherine says, of the Mount family, another very, very illustrious name in Monmouth County and other places too. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I hope you know your, your genealogy as far back as you can go. Um, thank you, Dana, for putting out the email. Um, somebody's going to be looking for my books. I appreciate that. Uh, anybody else want to say something in live or send me a note? I'm still here. Or you want to get back to what's on tonight, Thursday. What's on tonight on TV, Dana? I don't know. Anymore. I have no idea. I'm usually <laughs> in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Dane, you're not my age yet. <laughs> How about the Chasey family? Are you familiar with them? Uh, not in particular, Susan. Uh, you could tell me more about them if you'd like. Um, thank you, football. I don't know what that means. Um, thank you for football. Thank you to football. Okay, that's fine. Okay. I don't know the Chasey's off the top of my head. That doesn't mean that they're not important. Football tonight. Oh, I get it. Okay. Oh, Kathy, okay. Kathy. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give that a miss, but thank you, Kathy. Um, oh, anybody else have anything? By the way, for those of you, if I may uh, be so bold, if you'd like an autographed copy of any of my books, send me an email and I'll figure out how to get one of those to you. Um, and you can put that on eBay and it might be worth, I don't know. 12 cents more than it is the day I sign it, but uh, you won't get rich, that's for sure. Um, anybody else? I see Ron Bennett's on the on the line. Hi, Ron. Hope, hope you're doing well. Found out a lot about your family in the last couple of days. The Sodden family, or Soden, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Alice, I do not know, other than if I have them in my database, I they don't spring to mind, yeah. uh, but there's not a lot, a lot of spring left in my mind, so I'm not sure um about them but again feel free to write me and if i do know i will i will send you what i have or, oh, or at least give the you holmes ideas family Anne is asking about the holmes family oh Anne my has goodness to come in for that <laughs> so, oh my goodness there's a story yeah uh, that we don't have we don't have, we don't have a decade for the holmes family and i used to live in homedale and the holmes family are incredibly intricate and written all over our our history, as you well know, uh, and I think Danny, you got a big file in the homes, don't you? Oh yeah, and uh, I was just talking to somebody today. There's a descendant, a great, 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 whatever grandson of uh, Asher Holmes. So yep. running around, yep. bro. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So I and said, oh, by the way, invite him to come to MCHA. I'd love to show him just, the homes first. Just to compli to complicate people's genealogy. When you see, I don't know, genealogy.com or anything else. And you come across your family name, make sure you investigate because enslaved people sometimes took the name of their enslavers. Sure. So I know Black Holmes, White Holmes, mm -hmm. uh, as I do other names as well. So mm -hmm. um, there's hidden history there, if you will, because at some point you would assume a Black Holmes may have descent, may have descended from a white Holmes family who owned somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, it's intricate and hard to kind of, you know, pry apart Very sometimes. Hard, yeah. But uh, just be careful. Uh, well, let's see, Ron, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll let people get back to football or or in your case to uh, counting sheep, uh, Dana, whatever you do. <laughs> I, I hope you all know that Dana and I are friends. That's why we kid each other. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, we'll, t we'll tell them about our, our Spanish adventure some other time. Oh, yeah, we do have adventures together. That was yeah. fun. All in the, all in the, in the, uh, in the uh, furtherance of it, Monmouth County history, all the time. Always, yeah. Okay, right. well, Dana, again, thank you. And if Joe was here, I didn't see him. Thank you, Joe, for everything. He was here, yeah, he was here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say to everybody, as the last message, 
When you want to know anything about mom Italian history, please go. You want to give me your hours over there and how they get to see you, Dana? Yeah, absolutely. You could just make an appointment with us. Um, we're pretty flexible on the hours, uh, but it, it does depend. So if you email library at monmouthhistory.org, we'll set you up with an appointment. So it's, it's, it's the best resource I know, and without them, I'm nothing. Uh, you heard that, <laughs> right? That. I don't know. You seem to be going to all these other places, Rick, England, and I, I don't know. Not go backwards, Dana. Come on. Come on. <laughs> okay, folks. Good night. Uh, get a hold of me any way you can if you want. Dana, I'll see you sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Claire, I'll see you tomorrow. And um, everybody have a great night and great uh, Thanksgiving weekend. Okay. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you.